Welcome to this guide to foreign stations in Rule the Waves 2. Made very easy, or as easy as I can manage. I imagine, like me, you may well have been a little bit confused by the foreign station requirements. There's a lot that goes under the hood that's not really very obvious. So I've had a rummage around and I've uncovered these, if you like, seven things that you might want to keep your eye on in a nutshell. Okay, it's quite a big nutshell, but once you get used to it, I think it sort of makes sense. So firstly and foremostly, countries with overseas empires have a foreign station requirement. They're used to protect the colony from enemies and to subjugate your local population. Great Britain, as a global naval power, that's a national characteristic, has an additional foreign station requirement. If you don't meet your foreign station requirement, you will lose prestige. If you send big ships out to your foreign station, where big is over 6,000 tons, they will be less effective than if you send little ships. If you send short range or cramped accommodation ships, they will be extremely ineffective. If you set your ships to FS in the status column for foreign station, they will count to your foreign station tonnage wherever you are in the world. If you have ships on active fleet or trade protection, or I believe, but need to confirm, raiding, they will only count if they are in a sea area that requires foreign station. Finally, if you equip your ships for colonial service, they become 25% more effective on foreign stations. Effectively, their tonnage, instead of being, say, 6,000 tons, becomes 7,500 tons in meeting this foreign station requirement. And this allows you to design some ships specifically for foreign station, make them cheap, make them low fighting value, let them just fulfill this onerous requirement and save your money for the battle fleet. Let's break this down a little bit more. So rule number one, small ships not fitted for colonial service. They get a tonnage modifier of nothing. Everything else has a modifier, but if it's a small ship, and by small we mean it's less than 6,000 tons, and it's not fitted for colonial service, and it's not short range, and it doesn't have cramped accommodation, and you've put it either on FS status or on another status in a sea zone with foreign service requirements, then you will get that tonnage. So this perfectly ordinary 1900, 500 ton destroyer, if you send it out on foreign station, will account for 500 tons of that requirement. Simple. Number two, if you have a large ship not fitted for colonial service, it will have this modifier applied to it. So you take its tonnage, you multiply it by 0 0.3333, you cut it by a third, and then you add 4,000 tons. So this happens to ships over 6,000 tons. So here you have a perfectly ordinary 14,900 ton uh, pre-dreadnought battleship. It only deducts 8,966 tons to foreign station requirement. A major uh, reduction. And the bigger the ship, the bigger the loss. If you have a small ship that is fitted for colonial service, then you are modified by 1.25. If you're under 6,000 tons and you have colonial service and the usual stuff, then this 1,600 ton corvette contributes 2,000 tons to the foreign station requirement. This is what I meant by a specially configured, cheap, low value. If you have a large ship fitted colonial service, you will still take the tonnage and reduce it by a third and add the 4,000 tons and then apply a 1.25 modifier, so increase it by a quarter. So here we have an 11,000 ton armored cruiser. It, with the colonial service fitted, 
will give you 9,583 tonnes to your foreign station requirement. If you didn't have colonial service fitted, it would have only have counted 7,666, so nearly 2,000 tonnes less on this 11,000 tonne armed cruiser. If your ships have either short range or cramped accommodation, or short range and cramped accommodation, you will receive various penalties. So cramped accommodation, you get reduced by a third. Short range, you get halved. And both together, they get reduced by, well, you multiply them by 0 0.35. That's a whopping reduction. So here we have that 11,000 ton armed cruiser. And now, because it is short range and cramped accommodation, it's only contributing 2,683 tons to foreign stations. So using short range and cramped accommodation ships overseas is a really, really poor investment. Not to mention that during a war, short range ships cannot move from their sea zone. So if you want to deploy them around your empire, you can't do that. Finally, there's this national characteristic of global naval power. They must keep 10% of their fleet tonnage outside of the home area. Now, this only applies to Britain. Britain needs to keep 171,000 tons on foreign stations when you play at the very largest size. And if they deploy that, and it doesn't equal 10% of the tonnage, then you'll have to send more ships. I believe that this is a straight tonnage, so no colonial modifiers are applied. Likewise, there's no penalty for short range. However, you can't use cramped accommodation to fulfill this requirement. So, the cost to Britain in particular for ruling the waves in a rule Britannia kind of a way, is particularly heavy. So I'm going to unpack that a little bit, because if you can manage Britain, you can manage any of them. Britain has a need to dominate its home sea area because it's likely to have a conflict with France and Germany and Russia. It also needs to keep foreign stations requirement in 10 sea areas around the globe. So there's only four areas that it isn't required to send ships. These totals, by the way, can change depending on what's happening in these areas. For example, if there's a local war. And of course, they can change if you acquire or lose more colonies in these areas. In addition, Britain has this global naval power requirement to keep 10% of its fleet tonnage unadjusted by colonial uh, service outside the home area. And as Britain, if you are planning to have a conflict with Japan or the USA, you're also likely to need to improve basing and coastal fortifications in the North American East and West coasts, in the Caribbean and in Northeast Asia. Britain, when you play historical resources, gets an awful lot more money than anybody else. But this is the reason why. When you compare it to everybody else, you can see that, well, actually, if you combine all of these together, all the rest of the world together, it still wouldn't meet probably half of what Britain has to do. Uh, this is at a very large fleet size. Now, that's a, a very large fleet. If you go down to smaller and smaller fleet sizes, it does get less in quite a measured way. And that's a bit different. Here's that same chart for Britain. Here are the various fleet sizes. For France, you can see it goes down gradually. For the America, it stays the same until the very end. And for Germany, there's a big dip and then steady and then a dip again. As I say, if you can cope with Britain, you can cope with any of them. So here is a classic colonial gunboat. 
It's 1,600 displacement. That's nearly the max. Uh, 1,700 is the max. It contributes 2,000 tons to foreign service with colonial service fitted. It has a rubbish speed of 17 knots. It's got a massive bit of weight remaining and it only costs 2,453. It has two five inch guns and an ASW value of five. Obviously it's got a lot of uh, spare weight to have extra ASW fittings as the years go on. I strongly recommend that you avoid the temptation to fit more weapons and armor onto these ships because you could give it a two inch armor belt, no problem. You could give you could give it more five inch guns. You could probably give it a secondary battery as well. You can't obviously give it torpedoes, but you could make it a tough nut. But that's pointless because it's never going to appear in a battle other than by accident as a little uh, escort floating around on the side. And if that's the case, it's never going to be able to stand up to a passing battle fleet. So don't. It's primary features here are that it is the lowest cost per ton for foreign station so for each tonnage of foreign station it only costs 123 pounds or dollars or marks or rubles or lira it's also the second lowest asw cost per ton these are these are build costs by the way so how much does it cost to build for how much foreign station or ASW does it provide? It's also, and people I think don't often realize, dual status. So in peacetime, it obviously just fulfills the foreign station requirement, but in wartime, it can fulfill the foreign station requirement and the trade protection requirement if it's in an area that requires foreign station. It's life, well, I said 55 year, as long as a game. Um, you're never going to get rid of these things. You may decide to refit them, particularly with extra ASW equipment as it becomes available, and that's fine. You may just take the extra maintenance cost penalty and not update them. Personally, I would update, but it's a decision for you. And I like that this is an easy to manage 2000 ton. There's plenty of maths in this game. You don't want extra maths having to fulfill foreign station. So that's the colonial gunboat, and I recommend that should be the backbone of your colonial force. Next up is a colonial ASW Corvette. This is a classic 900 ton. It counts as 1,150 tons on foreign service if you fit it for colonial service. Again, it has a rubbish speed. It still has plenty of weight remaining. It costs a threadbare £1,661. I mean, you're just not going to be able to build a ship for anything less than that. I give it two four inch guns, and of course, it has in 1900 a five ASW value. You could, for an extra £100 and 27 tons of weight and a minus 10 rate of fire penalty, increase that to five inch guns. If you're worried about the number of corvettes submarine gun jewels that you might lose and have your corvette sunk it's it's perfectly legitimate choice um, this is the second lowest cost per ton to build for foreign service uh, 148 1.48 so a fair chunk more but compared to some of the other ships still very very cheap and of course, it has the lowest ASW cost, less than a minesweeper or less than a destroyer. Again, it's dual status. Foreign station is covered during a war if it's in an area that needs uh, a colonial requirement. And again, life is infinite. You're never going to get rid of these. Next up is a colonial cruiser. This is actually starts off really as a fleet cruiser that has colonial abilities attached to it so that when it's no longer able to sail with the main fleet because it's obsolescent it can still double up as a very successful colonial cruiser it's got 6000 tons weight that accounts for 7500 tons of foreign service if you fit it a speed 
of 22 knots, which is quite handy at 1900, a little bit of weight remaining, 25,459 in cost, a mixed six inch and four inch gun battery, three torpedoes, uh, one port, one starboard, and one aft. Personally, I always think these first generation ships are probably going to be uh, chased at some point in their life as they get uh, overhauled by more sophisticated ships and having a torpedo in the aft might just help it escape. It's a mild cost per ton for foreign station, 3.37. You can see that's a substantial jump from the Corvettes, but these are much, much more capable uh, warships. They can do anything. They can active fleet, uh, raiders, trade protection, as well as foreign station. They're also dual status for the same reason. And they have a active fleet life of 10 years minimum, possibly 15 if you decide to refit the engines, uh, and certainly a good 20 years foreign uh, service life. They're easy to manage as well. 7,500 is a, is a nice steady one. You could plump for its mini-me equivalent, the Colonial Scout Cruiser. Um, here are some examples. Throughout, I've given you examples of what the navies had actually built. It has half the displacement, 3,000 tons. So 3,750 in foreign service, 21 knots, 18 tons remaining. Much, you know, when, when you go smaller, Things get really tight. 11,638 to, uh, to build. So slightly less than half the cost. A battery of four inch guns, again, three torpedoes. This time a two inch armor belt, so immune against four inch guns. The bigger cruiser had a three inch belt, which is immune against six inch guns or six inch guns of 1900 vintage. Again, it's a mid cost to build. It's full capability when built, uh, dual status, and a 10 year active life, 15 years foreign station, maybe 20. It, it depends on your circumstances and what's happening. You do get two and a bit of change left over for the price of one 6,000 ton one. But I think the 6,000 ton one is so much more capable that the small increase in cost is well worth it. And that's it. Small ships count their tonnage in foreign stations. Large ships have their tonnage reduced by a third and then have 4,000 added on. If you fit your ships with colonial service, that adds a multiplier of 1.25. If your ships have cramped accommodation or short range or both, they have significant penalties applied. And Britain, as a global naval power, needs to deploy 10% of its fleet tonnage outside the home area. I hope that's made it a little bit more clear for you. I, I know it's quite a lot to take in. Um, I will include in the link below these notes so that you can write through them again. If you found this helpful, please uh, give it a like. Like tells YouTube that these videos are useful for Rule the Waves 2 fans. And thank you very much for watching and stay safe in these troubled times. Cheers for now.